وكذلك أوحينا إليك روحا من أمرنا ما كنت تدري ما الكتاب ولا الإيمان ولكن جعلناه نورا ولكن جعلناه نورا نهدي به من نشاء من عبادنا وإنك لتهدي إلى صراط مستقيم صراط الله الذي له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض ألا إلى الله تصير الأمور بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to another episode of Fundamentals of Faith In our previous episode we defined the meaning of ibadah or worship and we discussed the preconditions of ibadah and the motivational factors that are the driving forces behind any act of worship. In today's lesson, and in the next few lessons, we are now going to discuss a few manifestations, a few examples of the most important types of ibadah that a Muslim must do. And in today's episode, we will talk about two of these manifestations, the first one of which is putting one's trust in Allah, or tawakkul, and the second one is being patient at the decree of Allah, or sabr. We hope you'll join us for today's show. In today's show, we're going to talk about two of the manifestations and two of the most important types of ibadah. Putting one's trust in Allah and being patient at the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first of these is called in Arabic tawakkul. And the real meaning of tawakkul is to cut off all hope of attaining any good except from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tawakkul is a state of the heart. Your heart is attached to Allah and only to Allah. You realize that any good that will come to you, it will be from Allah. And any evil that will be averted from you, it will be by Allah's will and command. This is the meaning of tawakkul. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Ma'idah verse 23, وَعَلَى اللَّهِ فَتَوَكَّلُوا إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ and upon Allah, put your tawakkul if you are true believers. A condition. If you are believers, then put your trust only in Allah. Have your heart attached only to Allah. Expect the best only from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Likewise in Surah Fatiha, which we read in every single prayer, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ You alone do we worship, and your help alone is sought. Upon you is the tawakkul. Your help alone is sought. I don't seek anyone else's help except yours. And this is the reality of tawakkul. Likewise in Surah Yunus verse 84, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the situation of Musa alayhi salam with the people of Israel. When Fir'aun was going to attack them, Musa said, Ya qawmi, O oh my people, in kuntum amantum billah, if you truly believe in Allah, fa'alayhi tawakkalu, then put your tawakkul in him. In kuntum muslimin, if you are Muslims. If you're Muslims, if you have Iman, put your tawakkul in Allah and only in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tawakkul is a byproduct of Iman, of faith. And it is proportional to Iman. The more Iman you have, the stronger your tawakkul will be. And the less Iman you have, the weaker your tawakkul will be. This is because Iman ingrains in a person the power, the majesty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The more iman that you have, the more sure you will be that Allah and only Allah will give you what you want. And the weaker is a person's iman, the more he will rely upon other beings and other objects. So to put one's tawakkul, one's trust in a false deity, this is an act of major shirk which expels a person from the fold of Islam. If you trust an idol or a god or a dead saint that he will grant you what you want and he will protect you, then this is an act that goes against having tawakkul for Allah because you have tawakkul in other than Allah and therefore it goes against your ibadah, it goes against la ilaha illallah. So to have tawakkul in a supernatural circumstance and situation, for, uh, for example a deity or an or a object of worship or an idol, this is major shirk. But to have tawakkul in a physical matter, 
For example, there is a policeman and you think that he will protect you from being robbed. This is a physical matter. The first one is supernatural. A person, a, a, a dead saint or a grave or an idol. The second one, a physical thing like a policeman or like a doctor. You're sick and you go to the doctor. You think he'll cure you. If your heart is attached to these created objects, then this is a type of minor shirk. Minor. In other words, it doesn't expel you from the fold of Islam. And we're going to discuss minor and major shirk in a future episode. But the point I'm trying to say is that a person's heart must always, in all circumstances, be attached to Allah. That doesn't mean that you don't go to the, to the policeman to be helped. Or you don't go to the doctor to be cured. Of course not. But when you go, what is your psychological frame of mind? The mu'min, this is what it is. He says, Oh Allah, I am sick by your will. And I do not have the knowledge to cure this disease. And I know that there is a doctor so and so. And this is his speciality. You, O oh Allah, have given him this knowledge. So I go to him knowing that you are the one that has blessed him with this knowledge. And you are the one who will cure me of that. The frame of mind, brothers and sisters. It's not actions, it's the frame of mind. Another person goes to the doctor. And he feels in his heart, okay, I have now reached the doctor, he will cure me. There is no concept of Allah in his head. This is the problem. This is where it goes against one's iman and tawheed. Okay? So tawakkul is one of the fundamental byproducts of iman. And there are many benefits to it. Primarily, whoever has tawakkul in Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give him whatever he needs. Allah says in Surah Al-Talaq, verse 3, وَمَنْ يَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ فَهُوَ حَسْبُهُ Whoever has his tawakkul in Allah, Allah is sufficient for him. He has no need of anything else. Whoever puts his tawakkul in Allah, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sufficient for him. He doesn't have to turn anywhere else. There's also a beautiful hadith in uh, Sahih al-Bukhari. If you can hand me volume 8 of Sahih al-Bukhari, akhi. As you know, Sahih Bukhari, as we said over and over again, is the most authentic book after the Qur'an. And the scholars state that one of the interesting things about Sahih Bukhari is that Imam al-Bukhari has included his opinions in the chapter titles. So they say that the opinions of Bukhari are found in his chapter titles. Because he would always place the chapter title of his opinion, and then he would bring the hadith or the ayat that he uses to prove that point. Whereas, for example, Imam Muslim, Imam Muslim does not have chapter titles in his book at all. So we have here in Sahih al-Bukhari where Ibn Abbas narrates that when, Ibn, when Ibrahim was thrown into the fire, when was Ibrahim thrown into the fire? Nimrud, the king Nimrud, the evil king, he built a huge fire after Ibrahim had destroyed their idols. And he challenged or he told Ibrahim that I'm going to punish you in this fire. So Ibn Abbas said, when Ibrahim السلام, was about to be thrown into the fire, he said, حَسْبُنَ اللَّهُ وَنِعْمَ الْوَكِيلُ Allah is sufficient for us, and what a great protector He is. When he said this, what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do? وَقُلْنَا يَا نَارُ كُونِي بَرْدًا وَسَلَامًا عَلَى إِبْرَاهِيمٌ Allah said to the fire, O oh fire, be coolness and peace to Ibrahim. Be cold and peace to Ibrahim. Don't burn him. Scholars say, had Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only said, be cold to Ibrahim, Ibrahim would have frozen to death in the fire. But because Allah said, frozen because of coldness. But because Allah said, be cold and peace. Don't harm Ibrahim. So when Ibrahim was thrown into the fire, he came out unscathed. Likewise, Ibn Abbas says, that when mankind in the battle of Ahzab gathered to attack them, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, حَسْبُنَ اللَّهُ وَنِعْمَ الْوَكِيلُ Allah is sufficient for us and what a great protector He is. And when He said this, then the 10,000 people that have come to attack Medina, and they are only a few thousand, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the wind and the sandstorms and the rain, and He sent all the elements, and they fled themselves without the Muslims having to lift a sword. Allah is sufficient for us and what a great protector He is. Likewise, when Musa salam said the same thing to his people, what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do? He parted the Red Sea in front of them. When Fir'aun was chasing them, and they see the army behind them, and in front of them is certain death, and behind them is certain death, Musa says, put your tawakkul in Allah. Allah will save you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala causes the Red Sea to open up, and they are saved in this manner. This is tawakkul, and these are the products of tawakkul. 
When a person puts his trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will grant him what he wants. And when he puts his trust in other than Allah, when he depends upon other people to get what he needs, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not allow those goals to be met. One second, it is important to realize that tawakkul is a state of the heart and not the body. Many people they think tawakkul means, I'm just going to sit back at home and say, Oh Allah, if, you're gonna, if I'm going to get money, it's going to come to me. I don't have to go out and search for money. Okay? This type of logic goes against the Quran and the Sunnah. Because Allah has created the goal, whether it be money, whether it be family and children, whether it be whatever. And He has also created the means to get to that goal. So the true mu'min tries to attain the goal using the means to come to the goal and prays to Allah to allow him to arrive at that goal. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us over and over again to exert the efforts and then put tawakkul in Allah. As Allah says in Surah An-Nisa verse 71, O oh, you who believe, be prepared against the enemy. In another verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Anfal verse 60, prepare yourselves against the enemies as much as you can. Prepare yourselves. Make yourselves artillery, armaments, whatever you can. Defend yourselves. And yet another verse, Surah Baqarah verse 197, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala discusses about the hajj and He says, while you go for hajj, tazawwadu. Make sure you take food for the journey. Don't just take no food and say Allah, so Allah will grant me. No, tazawwadu. But He also reminds us, فَإِنَّ خَيْرَ الزَّادِ التَّقْوَى The best provision for the journey is the taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We'll take a short break and we'll be right back inshallah soon. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to Perspectives. I'm your host, Musa McGuire. There are 11 million, you know, not 1 million, not 3 million, 11 million people, uh, children under five, that die every year. I mean, it's mind-boggling, and nobody cares. It is an action uh, and the movement from the people's side. You cannot press a button and say, well, stop at this point. Well, they have been hurted, and that is an action. We can go to those big countries, and we tell them, you are producing this TV or this machine, and this small part of it, I can make it better, smaller and less expensive. So while Islam would allow in vitro fertilization outside the uterus from uh, the uh, a married man and woman and then implanted in the uterus of this woman. Discussing uh, tawakkul, if you can bring me volume 4 of uh, Sunan al-Tirmidhi, there is a beautiful hadith which summarizes for us the essence of tawakkul. What does it mean to place one's trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Sunan al-Tirmidhi is written by Muhammad ibn Isa ibn Surah al-Tirmidhi and he was one of the famous scholars of his time and his book is considered to be the fourth of the six books. Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, Sunan Abi Dawood, Sunan al-Tirmidhi, the fourth. And then we have uh, Ibn Majah and An-Nisai after that. And of the hadith narrated in this book, is that a man came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he said, O Messenger of Allah, should I tie my camel and then have tawakkul in Allah or should I leave it and then have tawakkul? So the person's confused about tawakkul. What does it mean? Should I just leave my camel and then have tawakkul? Allah will protect it? Or should I tie it up? What should I do? The Prophet ﷺ said, tie up your camel and then have tawakkul. Do what you need to do and then have tawakkul. Go look for a job and then have tawakkul, Allah will give me the money. Your heart is attached to Allah and not to your boss or to your factory. It is a state of the heart and mind and not a state of the body. True tawakkul means that you exert as much as you can to arrive at the goal. And then your heart is attached not to the means, not to yourself, not to the people around you, but to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And yet under the hadith, in the same volume of a tirmidhi beautiful hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Were you to have tawakkul in Allah, the way that you should have tawakkul in Allah, 
the way that he deserves to have tawakkul, then he will give you your food and sustenance just like he gives the birds their food and their sustenance. Mm -hmm. The birds leave their nests early in the morning with empty stomachs and they come back late at night with full stomachs. The birds, every single bird, it leaves early in the morning as soon as dawn breaks. It goes out of its nest in search for food. Where will it come from? How will it happen? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides for it until by the time it comes back late at night, it comes back with a full stomach. And not just that, if it's a mother, it will feed. Out of the food it has, it will feed its own children. This hadith also shows you the true meaning of tawakkul. Because the Prophet ﷺ didn't say that the bird will sit in its nest and wait for the food to drop. No, he said the bird will leave early in the morning. Why? To exert itself, to search for food, to do all that it can in order to find that food, and then it will get that food. So too is tawakkul. A person exerts himself as much as he can, and his heart is attached to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then he will taste the fruits of that tawakkul. The second concept that we're going to talk about today is sabr or patience. And this also is a byproduct of iman. The more one's iman is, the more one's patience will be towards the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Ali Imran verse 200, this is the last uh, surah or the last ayah in Surah Ali Imran. O you who believe, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, isbiru, be patient. Wasabiru, be extra patient, persevere. وَرَابِطُوا and stand firm وَاتَّقُوا الله and have the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala likewise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the believers in Surah Al-Ra'd verse 33 he says وَالَّذِينَ صَبَرُوا بْتِغَاءَ وَجْهِ رَبِّهِمْ the believers are those who are patient they have sabr in order to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also tells the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam وَلِرَبِّكَ فَاصْبِرْ be patient for the sake of your Lord so patience or sabr is an integral part of one's iman. There are three types of patience. There are three types of patience. The first patience is demonstrate, demonstrated in response to something evil that happens to us. One of our family relatives might pass away. Our financial situation might get bad. Something happens, it's beyond our control. So we respond to that with patience. As Luqman, the wise man, says to his son in the Quran, as reported by the Quran in Surah, in Surah Luqman, verse 17, وَاصْبِرْ عَلَى مَا أصابك. Luqman advises his son, be patient at what happens to you. So one type of sabr is to be patient at the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second type of patience, which is a higher level, is to restrain yourself from committing sins. This is the second, you have, to, you have to be patient, you have to hold yourself back. You want to do a lot of things, but you have to be patient. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, describing the people of Jannah, that the angels will come in upon them from every door, and they will say to the people of Jannah, Salamun alaykum bima sabartum. Peace be upon you because you were patient. Patient at what? Patient against committing the sins of Allah. You had the sabr not to commit the sins. You, you could hold yourself back. So therefore the angels will congratulate them in Jannah because of their patience. The third category of patience is the highest form of patience. And that is patience in constantly worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have to be patient to pray every day, five times a day. Wake up for Fajr, then Dhuhr, take a break from your, from your work. Then Asr, when you come back hungry and, and Maghrib, when you're tired you want to when you're tired and you want to eat, then Isha, when you want to go to sleep, it's patience. Every single prayer requires an effort for you. This is sabr. Likewise, all of the other acts of worship, you require patience in order to do them. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Maryam verse 65, فَعْبُدْهُ وَاسْطَبِرْ لِعِبَادَتِهِ Worship Him and Him alone and be extra patient in that worship. Worship requires patience. Likewise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the Prophet sallallahu in Surah Taha verse 132, وَأْمُرْ أَهْلَكَ بِالصَّلَاةِ Command your family to pray. Subhanallah, look at this. Not just pray yourself, command your family to pray. How important must prayer be when the Prophet sallallahu is even being told, command your family. Of course you have to pray, but it is so important. Allah is commanding him in the Qur'an 
Command your family, your wife and your children. وَأْمُرْ أَهْلَكَ بِالصَّلَاةِ وَاسْطَبِرْ عَلَيْهَا Be extra patient when it comes to this command. Continue to advise them and be patient in commanding them to pray. The rewards of sabr or patience are too many to mention in one lecture. Of them is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves those who are patient. As Allah says in Surah Ali Imran, verse 146, Wallahu sabirin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves those who are patient. Another blessing is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be with those who are patient, meaning He will support them and help them. As Allah says in Surah Anfal, verse 46, Wasbiru inna Allah sabirin. Be patient, Allah is with those who are patient, meaning that He will support them, aid them, and help them. And of them is that the people who are patient will be rewarded infinitely without any account. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Zumar verse 10, إِنَّمَا يُوَفَّ الصَّابِرُونَ أَجْرَهُمْ بِغَيْرِ حِسَابٍ Those who are patient will be rewarded because of their patience without any account. Allah will not count how many good deeds you're getting. He will just give it to you without any hisab, without any accounting. Why is sabr part of one's tawheed and iman? Because showing anger at the decree of Allah is showing anger at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's a beautiful hadith in, uh, Sahih, in Sahih Muslim in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said that he is not one of us who hits the chests and who tears the shirts and who cries out with the cries of the Jahiliyyah or the pre-Islamic uh, Arabs. What does this hadith mean? When someone would die of the pre-Islamic Arabs, of the Jahiliya Arabs, then his whole family would beat themselves on their chests. And they would tear their clothes apart to show their resentment and anger. And they would cry out the cries of the Jahiliya. What are we going to do now? How are we going to live? This type of cries. So, the Prophet ﷺ told us that he is not one of us who does these acts. Why? Because it shows displeasure at the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Therefore, this shows displeasure at Allah. That is why sabr is an integral part of one's tawheed and iman. What is meant by sabr is not that one is happy at the decree of Allah. No. Sometimes things happen that every human being will be sad when they happen. For example, uh, there's a beautiful hadith in Sahih Bukhari. If you can give me volume 3 of Sahih Bukhari. Akhi. Sometimes something happens to someone and he can't help but feel sad. Suppose someone's child passes away, or one's mother or father. It is not humanly possible to feel, Jazakallah khair, it is not humanly possible to feel happiness at this. But what is required is that one show patience, perseverance, forbearance, steadfastness. This is the point, is that one not display apparent signs of anger. One accept the will of Allah. It doesn't mean he's going to be happy or jump for joy, no. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the greatest human ever to walk the face of this earth, Allah subhanahu wa taala tested him like he tested no other man, and of the things that he tested him with, was that he willed that the son of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Ibrahim, to live only for a year and a half, and then to take his soul away, right when he's at the prime of childhood. This is when the child is the most sweetest and the cutest. One and a half years old. Right at this time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed that Ibrahim's soul should be taken away. So the Prophet sallallahu had the child in his arm while the soul was being taken away. And he started to cry. This is in hadith 1303 in Sahih Bukhari. He started to cry. And the Sahaba were around him. They said, do you cry, Ya Rasulullah? Do you cry? He said, this is a sign of mercy. These tears are a sign of mercy. And then he said, Indeed, the eyes cry and the heart is very sad. But we only say that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with. Verily, we are very depressed and sad at your death, O Ibrahim. The heart is grieved and the eyes cry. But we don't say anything except what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be pleased with. And this is the meaning of sabr. That you are, you are going to act like a man, as they say. You're going to take it as a mu'min, as a believer in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whatever Allah decrees, you do not say anything, nor act that, in a way that will show displeasure towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
So these are the two aspects that we'll mention today, tawakkul and sabr. We hope to see you next time when we'll continue talking about other manifestations of ibadah, of uluhiyyah, of the pure worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Until next time, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.